So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, online seminar of the Central Asia program and uh, done this time in partnership with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty to discuss the situation in Afghanistan and its uh, uh, impact on Central Asia. The title of our event is Ground Truth, Local Views About the Taliban's Return. And of course, it's really very difficult to, to succeed in having some kind of critical distance, trying to understand what is happening now because things are changing so fast. Sorry for the little one crying in the background. Uh, things are changing really very fast now uh, uh, on the ground and, and it's really becoming a question of just days before things evolve. Uh, uh, in a maybe more dramatic way. So we have three great speakers with us today. We have uh, uh, from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, Malali Bashir, who is the journalist and video producer for the Afghan service, uh, producing both in uh, uh, Dari and in Pashtun. And we have uh, uh, also Siroji Din Tolibov, who is the managing editor of the Tajik uh, service and we have with us uh, Melanie Sadodai who is uh, finishing her PhD in my alma mater in France at the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilization and who is also a visiting fellow at the Central Asia program at GW and at the Sigur Center for Asian Studies at GW and who was uh, uh, in Tajikistan uh, uh, at the beginning of the summer. So I will give the floor to our three speakers for like 10 minutes each and then uh, uh, we will open the floor for the discussion. I invite you to have uh, to, to write your question in the chat. We have really a lot of people today, so we will have to do by uh, uh, writing. So please ask your question or your comments in the chat. And at the in the second part of the event, I will moderate the discussion and try to ask as many questions as, as we will have time uh, for. So once again, uh, uh, welcome. And then let's begin. Malali, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this is a great opportunity to speak about uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. And I thank you all for your time for being here in this discussion. Uh, I would like to start with the media landscape in Afghanistan, what is going on and how the media and the journalists are uh, actually uh, uh, in what kind of a situation they are. Uh, with the um, uh, fall of the government on uh, last Sunday, August 15, um, and uh, when the Taliban entered um, Kabul, uh, the capital of Afghanistan, uh, there was a, a kind of panic and uh, uh, the kind of fear that spread across the country and uh, an uncertainty um, held grip of everywhere, uh, including uh, journalists um, and uh, the, the kind of uh, freedom of expression and freedom of uh, speech they had been exercising for the past 20 years, they feared for that and uh, for, for losing that right, uh, right away after the Taliban um, took over. So um, uh, actually, uh, there, there are reports that um, the Taliban have been going door to door looking for uh, journalists and um, trying to intimidate them, telling them that we know about you. And uh, in some uh, cases, they were beaten also. Um, uh, in other cases, uh, most of the media, television, uh, let's talk about the television uh, channels. In provinces, uh, most of the televisions were shut down. Um, they were not functional anymore. And uh, the, especially those uh, that are being uh, run by uh, private, um, uh, pr private uh, television channels. Uh, and uh, uh, there was also, uh, we witnessed that um, in Kabul, uh, a Taliban uh, members were uh, interviewed uh, in Kabul studio in one of the channels, uh, in one of the TV channels in um, Afghanistan by a woman uh, present, uh, presenter uh, in a TV channel. And uh, there was also um, uh, some reporting that uh, a woman also stood on the streets of Kabul and gave live reports. Later on, the same women who were um, in the studio, some of them uh, took to Twitter and uh, started complaining how their uh, situation is deteriorate, deteriorating as journalists and they are not able to work anymore. 
Uh, in uh, radio stations, I would like to mention that um, uh, some of the radio stations are also shut down in uh, provinces. Uh, there are two reasons uh, that are told um, by the people who are running these uh, media um, organizations. One is that they are told by the Taliban to run all the content that is approved by uh, this group. Uh, and uh, because uh, these people refuse to uh, run one-sided reporting, uh, they have to shut down uh, their operations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people are um, complaining that uh, they shut down their operations because uh, they were told to, um, and they are not allowed to um, uh, operate as they, they have been doing previously. So uh, in the beginning uh, of the week, um, after Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, these days, people have been saying that, uh, you know, the Taliban let uh, TV channels function in Kabul because they wanted to use this platform for themselves uh, to uh, tell the world that they have changed and that they are still sitting with a woman presenter uh, and they are letting women journalists uh, report from the streets. Uh, but um, you know the it's it's uh, the kind of um, situation where uh, uh, journalists are f uh, fleeing the country. Uh, women um, usually they used to be very vocal uh, about their rights and what they are doing and how they are uh, faring in the society. And now it's very difficult to speak with them on air because they fear for their lives. The activists, women who were running NGOs and um, um, journalists, it's um, very. It has become very difficult to talk to them actually live uh, on any uh, channels. Uh, and uh, uh, I also want to speak about um, how the uh, the government and non-government offices um, uh, are functioning these days. Most of the ministries were closed uh, because people uh, did not uh, go to work, one, and because um, there was such an uncertainty that uh, people could not go uh, back to their work. Uh, most of the, um, the, the, the times we also got reports that um, especially women were told not to um, uh, come to offices anymore. Uh, I would like to bring you to your attention the, uh, the presidential palace um, with female staff who also uh, put, um, they, they released a video statement on uh, social media saying that they were returned home by the Taliban and they were not let um, into their offices. Uh, there, is, there is also um, a report that uh, in Kandahar city uh, from Azizi Bank, women were uh, returned home uh, and they were not let inside their offices uh, because they wanted to work and continue uh, their jobs, but they were, um, they were turned from the door and not let inside their offices. And there are other reports um, uh, like uh, 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 in Ghor uh, province, uh, the women affairs uh, director, she told us that she was fired the moment uh, Taliban took over the country and um, she was told, that she and her colleagues were told that they are not working anymore with the government and she can go home. And um, this, uh, these are some of the examples I, I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, on the other hand, um, Zabihullah Mujahid, who is the spokesperson for the Taliban, and also Suhail Shaheen, who is also a member of the, uh, of the negotiating uh, team from the Taliban side in Doha. Both of them have been saying that people are, uh, you know, encouraged to go back to work and uh, they will not uh, uh, put any restrictions on media and uh, they have been uh, saying that you know people are um, allowed to go to work um, but this is the scenario uh, on the ground um, uh, if I have a little more time I would also like to talk about the education and how the schools are doing so uh, we have uh, also uh, been covering schools and how the uh, girls especially are going to schools or not uh, since the Taliban have uh, taken over the country and uh, the capital Kabul. Um, we have reports in some of the areas like Badakhshan and Kunduz where women and girls are not 
uh, restricted from going to schools. In fact, we have reports that um, you know the Taliban have told all the girls and women to go to uh, schools and continue their studies, but uh, they are told to go in an Islamic hijab, which is not actually uh, explained what it means. Women have been telling us that you know, according to their interpretation of Islam, they have been using Islamic hijab for the past. 20 years and now they don't understand what it means. Um, let's also keep in mind that the uh, burqa prices have skyrocketed uh, across the country. We have report from Herat province that um, previously the burqa prices were around 400 and 500 Afghanis and now it's 2,500 uh, and around that range. So women are rushing to buy those uh, blue burqas because they think that that's the kind of Islamic hijab the Taliban mean, but the Taliban have not told any of us what they mean by Islamic hijab. Uh, in uh, uh, Herat, uh, uh, we al also had report that uh, when uh, women wanted to go into uh, the university for attending classes, they were turned and they were told to go back uh, home because the university was not open for them anymore. Uh, also, um, uh, in uh, uh, Nimruz province, um, women uh, teachers, they told us that, uh, you know, there are uh, reasons children are not going back to school because there is a huge displacement because of the fighting, because of the uh, the attacks that the Taliban were doing um, in this uh, province. And uh, after the province was captured, there was a huge amount of massive um, displacement of the uh, locals. And so the kids who, who were going to schools are now lost in, um, in around uh, the, the country and they have, most of them have fled to Kabul because they thought that this was a secure area and ta Taliban wouldn't be able to uh, go to uh, Kabul and people were IDPs in parks and other um, open areas. Um, and uh, also there are um, reports that um, uh, the Taliban have been um, uh, actually giving out amnesty cards to people who used to work with the, with the government forces and also especially army. But these amnesty cards are um, still not functional somewhere because people are putting uh, their uh, videos, uh, pictures online uh, on the internet and sharing their stories, how they were beaten by the Taliban. And uh, so there is a kind of a gap of communication uh, that is uh, going on. Uh, either there's a gap of communication between the leaders of the Taliban and those members uh, who are the foot so soldiers now patrolling the streets of Afghanistan, that they do not are on the same, they are not on the same page uh, for not intimidating the civilians and not going after the journalists. And there, there is actually an amnesty for everybody. Uh, but we, we see instances that th that's not happening. Um, uh, right now at the moment. Uh, and also, uh, there, there- Malali, I will ask you to yeah, shorten now you. The, the conclusion. Thank no, you. no, if you want to just add a little bit. Uh, so this, the, so I, I don't want to uh, cross my five, uh, five, 10 minutes limit. So I think that would be all and I would be also able to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really a, a, an excellent report on this uh, kind of dramatic situation for women uh, education and media globally. Siro, uh, Siro Jidin, please. Hello, hi, uh, dear participants and hosts of today's discussion. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, the sudden takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban came as a shock to many people in Tajikistan. Nobody in Tajikistan, even stand supporters of Taliban, expected Kabul to fall so quickly. Uh, um, and uh, on the surface, as if nothing has been going on in Tajikistan, people, you know, so, uh, 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 keep their regular life and nothing has changed. But on the border areas, uh, as you know, Tajikistan has border of more than 1,357 kilometers border with uh, Afghanistan, mostly remote areas in the northern parts and northeastern parts of Afghanistan. Uh, they say that they started hearing the sounds of bullets, firings more frequent than it was before. As you know, there are several bridges uh, linking Afghanistan with uh, Tajikistan and the, these uh, border areas, these uh, bridges are now 
controlled by the Taliban. And uh, you can see from the Tajik side, the white uh, uh, Taliban flag, uh, flag uh, and, um, and also, uh, the, as we know, one of the flags was uh, was put raised by the um, uh, Tajik uh, militant, uh, so-called Tajik uh, ta uh, uh, Talib, Talib from Tajikistan. Now, only hours after the uh, Taliban took control of the Afghan capital, I saw on the social media, I would say the mixed reaction of people in Tajikistan. Uh, I would divide them into three categories. Uh, the first group uh, are those who mostly belong to so-called intelligentsia or um, uh, intellectuals, uh, teachers, engineers, uh, 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 literary critics, historians who know Afghanistan better than uh, ordinary people, other uh, than other strata of society. Uh, they saw the Taliban's victory as a defeat uh, for the Tajiks on the southern side of Amudarya River and have taken it very seriously. They see the Taliban as a Pashtun-oriented group and believe that Taliban are seeking revenge against other ethnic uh, groups, including uh, Tajiks who have often fought against the group you know, for over the years, especially those who live in uh, Badakhshan, uh, and uh, Panjshir Valley and other parts of Afghanistan. Uh, um, uh, this group of people uh, uh, the, uh, have been posting, uh, uh, you know, their posts on the social media and the Tajik segment of Facebook is now full of uh, such controversies. They do not believe in the Taliban's promises and see their victory as a serious threat uh, to the Tajik society and Tajik identity in Afghanistan. Uh, the second group, most of whom are very ordinary people, residents and not very religious, or I would say political. Uh, uh, they are uh, mostly migrants who live in Russia, uh, or peasants in Tajikistan, you know, farmers. They have mostly been intimidated uh, by uh, uh, armed groups with a uh, basic beards and mustaches. Um, one of them whom I talked to uh, said that uh, seeing Talib uh, in such clothes would make him scared and sad. Uh, this group of people are also deeply concerned about the rise of power of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, as they say it, uh, fanatics and fear that one day they would encourage uh, similar groups of people uh, uh, in Tajikistan. And the third group, of course, mostly consists of religious people and individuals dissatisfied with the current policy led by the President Rahman. Uh, they are, in fact, are happy with the Taliban's victory. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, there are many of them, but uh, as they do not openly express their views because of the, you know, in order to avoid repressions from the government. But in private conversation, I had uh, some of them said that uh, Taliban's victory and statements on fighting against corruption after the uh, fall of uh, uh, Kabul is a warning signal to such authoritarian centralization rulers like Rahman. Uh, as you know, Tajikistan is the only neighbor of Afghanistan that has no, uh, that hasn't had any uh, talks of formal negotiations with the Taliban. But the Taliban's rise to power and the fall of Kabul post official Dushanbe with a serious dilemma about the, uh, their recognition. However, Taliban's victory is still difficult to call absolute because of the resistance uh, which started uh, uh, led by Ahmad Masood, Ahmad Shah Masood's son. Uh, uh, and they declared anti-Talibanization, uh, the Taliban uh, mobilization in Panjshir province of Afghanistan. And uh, uh, the first uh, vice president of Afghanistan, Amurullah Saleh also proclaimed himself as a caretaker president of Afghanistan. So Tajikistan also faces a difficult dilemma now. Tajik authorities, uh, uh, which 
uh, you know, all this time, unlike its neighbors, refused to negotiate with the Taliban and supported official Kabul. Now, uh, Afghan ambassador in the Taj Tajikistan a few days ago uh, recognized Amrullah Saleh as a legitimate uh, head of the state. I don't think that the Afghan ambassador made this statement without consulting with the Tajik authorities. So this might be an early signal that the official Tajikistan authorities in Dushanbe would support the resistance if the resistance, uh, you know, proves itself as a very, uh, you know, stubborn uh, and uh, very serious uh, power uh, uh, in fighting against the Taliban. But uh, so far, uh, Tajik government has not made any statement if it's going to recognize the Taliban or not. Uh, the choice between ethnic Tajiks attempting to revive the Northern Islands and the Taliban controlled Kabul will obviously uh, prove difficult for uh, Dushanbe at the moment. Um, uh, in my opinion, Tajik authorities will wait uh, if the key uh, powers, key players, including United States, Russia, uh, UK and China's position uh, uh, are clear and only after that they will be able uh, to make um, uh, a final decision, uh, uh, Tajik government. Uh, Dushanbe at the moment is proceeding from the current situation and not from the ethnic solidarity with the Panjshiri people or uh, uh, and the second largest ethnic group uh, in Afghanistan, Tajiks. Uh, during the war, of course, uh, they provide assistance to Ahmad Shah Massoud uh, during the civil war. And after that, when Taliban came to power for several years, uh, uh, but it was at the behest of Moscow. So the ethnicity of Massoud was not a priority back then. At the same time, the Tajik authorities were one of the first uh, to start accepting fleeing Afghan militaries on the border areas and provide the Tajik, Tajikistan's border areas for Afghan refugees. As we know uh, today, for example, uh, more than 400 uh, Afghan refugees uh, uh, landed at uh, Kulab airport in the south of Tajikistan. Probably uh, these uh, refugees uh, somehow uh, uh, have connections with the Western allies and eventually they will move to the third country. Uh, uh, however, as you know, the Russian president harshly criticized the uh, U.S. plan to temporarily uh, house Afghan refugees in Central Asia, including Tajikistan, uh, considering it uh, uh, as a direct threat uh, to his country and, uh, uh, as they put it, uh, the southern borders of Russia. Uh, this may force, of course, Tajik authorities to be more cautious to provide Afghans with temporary shelters. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, financial uh, uh, income or support which might flow from the various international organizations, including U.S. and uh, 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 United Nations, will be very difficult to resist. So. Uh, today, as you know, the uh, CSTO uh, uh, leaders uh, had a, held, have held uh, the uh, online meeting and Tajik president also attended there and uh, the press office of uh, Tajik president made a uh, statement uh, which is, uh, says the political regime in Afghanistan must be based on the free exercise of the will of Afghan people, all Afghan people. Strict accountability, guarantees, and protection of the social, political interests of all segments of society are crucial to the stability of any Afghan government, uh, it concluded. So uh, as you can see, uh, Tajikistan is still inclined to, uh, not directly, even not directly, but indirectly to support resistance but it will de depend on the on the ground uh, whether uh, 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 anti-Taliban forces uh, uh, can prove themselves as a real uh, force in Afghanistan. So uh, this is why I think, uh, uh, and apart from that, of course, uh, 
uh, all uh, uh, serious decisions on Tajikistan foreign policy are made by uh, in the corridors of uh, Kremlin. Uh, of course, the biggest. Uh, uh, yes, Sema, I would you. have to ask you. No, no, if thank you want you. to conclude, but okay. <laughs> yes, uh, and the biggest uh, threat to Tajikistan are the Tajik Taliban at the moment. Uh, uh, the Tajik Taliban is basically a group of militants from Tajikistan who were be, have been fighting along with the Taliban in the northern and northeastern parts of Afghanistan, mostly that is Takhar province, Kunduz province, and the uh, Badashan province of Afghanistan. Uh, according to RFRL's Tajik service estimations, the group consists of uh, around 200 pro-Taliban militants were originally, as I said, you uh, from Tajikistan, and this group might cause, uh, you know, in the future, serious threats. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, analysis, Melanie. I give you the floor to continue, probably on Tajikistan. Thank you so much for uh, organizing this event, and um, I um, I was very very much interested by uh, what uh, Sirojudin and uh, Melanie said, um, and I totally second them on their uh, analysis. Um, there are three elements that I would like to, to mention. Um, the first one is um, the evolution of the perceptions uh, of the border communities uh, when it comes down to, uh, to what's going on in Afghanistan. I, I will rather focus on what's going on at the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. So there's a, the, there was a shift in perceptions ever since um, Kabul fell to, to the Taliban on August, uh, August 15th. Um, before, uh, people along the border uh, were not so much afraid by the Taliban. You know, they, they were considering it was um, uh, an Afghanistan problem. Uh, now they do fear that the Taliban will allow uh, terrorist groups to prosper and uh, that they will have a safe haven because, um, like uh, Sivajudin said, they are um, Tajiks fighting along, um, alongside the Taliban. And uh, the border communities in Tajikistan uh, know that. They know that there are Tajikistani citizens operating among those terrorist groups in Afghanistan, and especially in the provinces bordering Tajikistan. Um, in the Khatlon province, on the western side of the border, people see that the border is more militarized than it was before. So that's also a concrete sign for them, for the locals, that security uh, on the other side in Afghanistan could be com compromised. So um, that's uh, the, first, the first issue, but um, beyond the ge geographical issue of uh, Taliban hosting those groups or at least supporting them, um, the border communities also fear that, um, the, they also feel the, the spread of Taliban ideas through social media, for instance. You know? uh, they fear that the Taliban uh, will become a, sort of a, a model for uh, those fu fundamentalists operating in, in Tajikistan and that they would want to replicate the model of what the, the Taliban have done in Afghanistan. They see that it's, it's actually possible to topple um, a government. Um, and uh, I also saw, and I think Sir uh, Jadim probably saw that, um, that some Tajikistani people mentioned their concerns about also possible um, genocide against uh, the Tajiks of Afghanistan because they see the Taliban as a Pashtun-based terrorist group. And so they fear that um, Tajiks are gonna be are going to be killed. You know, they're, they're going to be massive killings. So we see uh, various perceptions that have been um, really shifting ever since uh, Kabul fell. Also, there's um, a lot of uh, sympathy and compassion for um, Afghans um, coming from Tajikistani border communities. Um, they, they don't really see the threat for them, but they see the threat for Afghans and they, they feel sad for what's going on. Uh, they call them uh, poor Afghans, you know, in Tajik, uh, Bichora, uh, meaning that they have a lot of compassion for them. Now, what's important to also highlight is that there are a lot of families um, that are scattered, you know, on both sides of the border. And um, uh, those people in Tajikistan, they worry about their families across the border. Uh, contact is not cut off. Um, they can call each other, but both sides, on both sides of the border, there's a lot of uncertainty concerning what's going to happen for people in Afghanistan. Um, they pray constantly, they're constantly praying for their families on the other side. Um, and Afghans also mentioned uh, in group prayers, you know, so it's, it's becoming a very important issue. Now, another thing that's important when it comes down to um, 
to what Tajikistani people on the border think about what's going on in Afghanistan is um, it's actually the cross-border markets. Uh, what's interesting is that some people uh, um, who live along the border, um, some of them live close to the cross-border markets, right? And they highly depend on those markets because of the types of products that are sold there, but also because the prices are much lower than what they find in Tajikistan. And so for some of them, um, the fact that the Taliban are in power means that uh, it means that peace is gonna, um, you know, it's gonna be taking place in Afghanistan. It doesn't mean that they support the Taliban, but they, they think that now that there's um, the Taliban in power, uh, peace is gonna be in Afghanistan. And so the cross-border markets are gonna be opening up. And um, the cross-border markets have been closed since the beginning of the pandemic. And of course, security on the other side didn't help. Um, but now that the Taliban took control, some people think that the cross-border market will be back into operating again. So um, that's something we hear along the border. And I think it's important to raise. Um, the, the second element I'd like to mention is uh, the refugees. And I'm sure it's going to come up um, in the, in the um, Q&A session. Um, and as usual, when it comes down to Afghanistan issues, um, the Tajikistani authorities have an ambiguous position, right? Um, so they declare that they can host a certain number of refugees based on the principle of humanity um, and on good relations. Uh, but right now, they actually don't host that many refugees. At least they don't host you know, everyday people, everyday Afghans, right? Um, so the people who are uh, technically refugees in Afghanistan, they're um, elite members um, or they are military uh, personnel, um, according to what we hear from the Afghan embassy in Dushanbe and according to the Tajikistani authorities. Um, and those people landed in uh, the Khatun province. Um, so people don't cross the border by foot, they, they cross it by, um, by, by, by flying technically. Um, and a case in point is what happened to the Afghan Kyrgyz um, in the Wakhan Valley who fled to Afghanistan um, a few weeks ago. So what happened was that the border troops in Tajikistan officially said that they gave them a shelter based on humanitarian values. But a couple of days later, they were sent back to Afghanistan when the Afghan government at the time reassured Tajikistan that they would be safe in Wakhan. Um, what happens now is that those people don't feel safe because Taliban are starting to collect taxes uh, by taking livestock from them or money if they have money. So they don't harm them, but they deprive them from valuable goods. Um, so we can, we can see, th there's one thing we should mention is that Tajikistan is probably not taking refugees as of right now because the 30 years of the independence are coming up. The celebration of the 30 years of the independence um, is coming up. And, um, security is much focused on uh, this event. So it's likely that Tajikistan will not accept any refugees before that date. Um, security needs to focus on the celebration. So right now, Tajikistan acts as a transit country for the Afghan refugees who arrive by plane and not by foot. Um, and um, they're all, there are also various sources, uh, for example, that um, state that former President Ashraf Ghani was in Tajikistan before going uh, to the UAE. So. Tajikistan is not likely to take refugees, in my opinion, but, um, before the celebration of the 30 years of the independence. Um, also, when we, if you want to talk really concretely, um, as of right now, there's no massive wave of refugees going to Tajikistan by foot. Um, they don't cross the border, and that's, there are many reasons for that. First, uh, many Afghans uh, along the border don't have documents to travel. Um, so technically they cannot go out of the country. Second, the border is closed and it's militarized on both sides. Um, the Taliban are present on the Afghan side of the border. And um, uh, I think uh, Sidhu Judy mentioned that we, we can very clearly see them. You know, we see the white flag and we see, we see Afghans from Tajikistan. Um, so they are making sure that nobody is going out, right? Uh, it's highly militarized and it's also militarized in Tajikistan, not evenly. Um, it's less militarized in, um, on the Badakhshan side rather than on the Khatlan side. So technically, you know, it's very hard to traverse the, the border uh, through the official border crossing points. Um, and we don't see illegal crossings either. 
and we haven't really seen any illegal crossings in the past, you know, even when the Taliban were not there. Um, third, um, those who could try to, to go to Tajikistan, um, they feared that they could be sent back to Afghanistan, right? They, they're not sure that Tajikistan will host them. And just because of that, they don't cross because they don't want to be a target then for the Taliban for trying to escape. Because if they come back to Afghanistan, they think that the Taliban will just chase them for trying to, to go away. So the pressure is very high, um, which leads me to the final point um, that I would like to mention. Um, and here I'm really talking about border communities and not the whole provinces which border Tajikistan, but what's going on concretely in Afghanistan on the Afghan side of the border, um, life continues. Um, people actually go to work, but um, we don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen once the government um, is formed in Afghanistan. And we, they don't know if the situation is going to change for them. Um, yes, they go to work and they continue living uh, their lives, but they have a very intense psychological pressure, right? Um, they're, they're concerned that changes are going to be brought. They, they are concerned that they're going to be persecuted once the political bureau of, of, uh, of the Taliban declares a single policy for the country. Um, so that's the violence that we actually observe. It's a psychological violence. Um, it's a psychological pressure. All communities are impacted. Uh, even the communities um, who are strictly uh, respecting the Taliban rules. So I think uh, Malali mentioned, uh, you know, women going out um, in Badakhshan, they're going out um, to school. Um, wearing the hijab, you know, those women are actually respecting and following the Taliban rules, um, but they, they have this mental pressure of, you know, what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my family. Um, and also everyone is victim of uh, taxation, right? I mentioned the, the Kyrgyz in Wakhan, but um, all people are, 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 you know, being deprived of um, either money or livestock by the Taliban who come to their homes and who actually ask them to, to, to give that away. Um, and so they come and talk, collect taxes. Um, and, and in my opinion, it's a, it's, it's a pressure that we need to emphasize. Um, the media report, uh, you know, the violence, the killings, the torture, but there are, there's also this psychological pressure um, that is everywhere in Afghanistan. Um, and I will, I will conclude with that. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Melanie, and thank you, the three of you, for these great analysis of, of the situation. There are several waves of questions that are um, um, coming. Let me begin, maybe, so one question for uh, Malali from uh, one of our colleagues, Frank, asking, do we have any idea about uh, uh, what is the public opinion in Afghanistan, how people are feeling that everything happening now is the responsibility of the US and of Western powers living or the responsibility of a failed and corrupt Afghan government? So do we have any clue about this uh, um, perception on the ground? And then for Melanie, and Sirojidin, there are several questions on the regional aspect, but we have uh, uh, people also asking about uh, what is happening in Uzbekistan and what is the uh, uh, Uzbek state uh, uh, perception of, so, so one of the Senate deputy chairman said that Taliban have changes and embrace new reality. So that seems more and more on the kind of the side of being optimistic, also declaring that the Taliban are not planning to cross border. So if, what the two of you could kind of disentangle what is the you think is the Uzbek position would be great. And then we move to another wave of questions. So Malali first. Thank you for the question um, about the perception of the people on the ground. Actually, the people are um, who we have talked with, um, especially women, they feel um, betrayed uh, by the whole world, uh, not only by the leaders of Afghanistan. Um, people um, on the ground are actually um, in a kind of, uh, as Mr. Sirajuddin earlier, he mentioned that they are in a shock. And um, this shock is going to uh, fade away um, slightly and then people will be um, accepting that the reality is uh, that the Taliban have control over the country and now the life has changed. And uh, this is just not a dream or a nightmare, it's, it's the reality. 
So um, the, the, it's, it's too early uh, to, to see and um, predict what's going to happen, uh, but um, things are going to be uncertain for a while uh, in, in the country. Uh, people um, actually are blaming the president, the jihadi leaders um, who left the country and uh, fled to, uh, went to actually uh, Pakistan and from there to Central Asian countries. Um, they have not been in contact with media, not um, answering any calls, not uh, talking about what they discussed with the Pakistani leaders. And um, the people are in such a dilemma that everybody is pointing fingers at everywhere. Um, uh, uh, they are holding Pakistan responsible uh, for, for the whole um, mess that uh, they think has been created in Afghanistan by paving the way uh, for the Taliban and uh, giving them sanctuaries and uh, um, all other support that they needed to take over Afghanistan. Uh, there is also um, people are thinking that um, actually this was um, um, the President Trump was actually talking with the Taliban and he, um, he even uh, people are also talking about the agreement that was signed between uh, the uh, Trump's administration and uh, the Taliban, where um, some of the clauses of the agreement say that, you know, Taliban will be um, not attacking, the, the Afghan soil will not be used against any other countries and this and that. So people are uh, saying that actually this was already decided for Afghanistan that the Taliban will be brought into, um, into power and they will be uh, given uh, the whole country. Um, on the other hand, also there, and we can see that the army is blamed, the military of Afghanistan. Uh, but um, we also have the arguments on the ground that, you know, Afghanistan has, uh, uh, Afghan army, 69,000 troops died in this, um, in this war. Uh, people are arguing that actually this was a global war uh, against terrorism and uh, the Afghans were fighting it. Uh, in the end, uh, the Afghans were the sole responsible for fighting this war. And so they have been giving victims in the war against this global terrorism. So um, Afghans are also mentioning that there are not only Very people true. who died in the military, there are so many people who were wounded, they, their limbs were cut off, they are blinded and their families are suffering because of this war. And so um, it's, uh, it's a mixed kind of a situation. Thank you so much, uh, Manali. Uh, Melanie and Sirojidin. Yeah, I will leave um, Sirojidin for this answer and then I, I can yeah, okay. can you repeat, you know, uh, the question once again in a so, short form? So the question is about the Uzbekis Uzbekistan perception of its own uh, stability and, and border security and the relationship with the Taliban. Yes, um, Uzbekistan was the first country in Central Asia which uh, started openly uh, talking to the Taliban and uh, uh, way before, several months before the occupation of Kabul, uh, uh, they held meetings with the top Afghan uh, Taliban officials and they hosted them. They took them to Bukhara and Samarkand, they gave the presents. And uh, uh, the foreign minister of Uzbekistan, uh, Kamil, was the first uh, official who said that Taliban was not a threat to Uzbekistan and it was not extremist organization anymore. So uh, we can see that uh, the Uz Uz Uzbekistan's uh, new government's attitude towards Taliban is more pragmatic. They understand that Taliban came to power and will last uh, forever there. And they have to you know, so find the common language in order to avoid disturbances in the future. Uh, Uzbekistan's border with Afghanistan is more than 135 kilometers, it's not big. So uh, for the Uzbekistan at the moment is uh, economic development, uh, uh, you know, establishing good economic relationship with whoever comes to power is more important than, uh, you know, being allied to one or another group. Now, this is why uh, the reason why Uzbekistan has not allowed 
Dostum even uh, Marshal Dostum to stay in Uzbekistan. He was uh, they they kind of asking him to leave, and he's in Turkey as far as we know. Uh, only few of the soldiers were allowed to to, to cross into Uzbekistan. Uh, that explains a lot. Uh, uh, apart from that, I'm sure Uzbek authorities took uh, insurances uh, insurances from the Taliban authorities that. Uh, militant groups like Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, although it is, uh, you know, it does not exist. There are a small bunch of groups inside Afghanistan and Syria, uh, so will not be uh, uh, finding uh, safe haven in Afghanistan if Taliban comes to power. And Taliban uh, have been announcing, saying, uh, uh, insisting that uh, there will be no uh, terrorist groups inside uh, Afghanistan. Uh, ta Taliban will not support any neighboring countries. So, uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the attitude of Uzbekistan is slightly different than Uzbekistan because Uzbekistan's uh, policy, as I said, is more pragmatic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, will, so just, I will just add to that that exactly Uzbekistan is um, the president wants to have an integrated economy in the region. So um they will do whatever it takes to you know make sure that the economic projects um that are um linked with afghanistan will actually be completed um and they are talking with the taliban and as far as i know uh the, the Uzbek government the Uzbekistani government sorry um is not uh, welcoming refugees and they, they don't want to have refugees um on their territory um so that goes along this line of you know um, being in talks, uh, talking with the Taliban and on the other side, not, not having refugees. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, second series of questions. We have been asked, can anyone confirm report that the government of Tajikistan has sent weapons to the resistance in Panjshir? And if we can expand on the, what is happening in Panjshir now about the, the, the global perception in Central Asia and in Russia, that it's a kind of return of the, the the old traditional kind of northern alliance potentially so if you could comment on the central asia and potentially russia perception of of the the resistance in panchir and and last question probably about china's position in central asia and this ambiguity of both more or less uh, uh, negotiating with the taliban to ensure its own uh, the security of its own asset in afghanistan and at the same time having the usual security-oriented narrative with Central Asian partner, how will it make the, the position of China difficult toward uh, Central Asians? Um, I don't know who would like to begin. I can probably answer on China. Um, uh, I, I think China is the biggest player right now um, in Afghanistan, the international player, I mean, because um, they openly want to talk and negotiate with the Taliban because they do have a lot of economic interests in the country and they're not hiding it. Um, uh, actually, I think they're the, the um, spokesperson of the foreign ministry of um, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry uh, actually said it very clearly. You know, they, they have economic interests, um, so they want to make sure that they are hands in hands with the Taliban to have those uh, projects. Um, you know, um, being um, built, all the infrastructure being built, um, that they will, you know, extract the resources, the natural resources of, of Afghanistan. Um, and basically their, their take is that, you know, tell, they say to the, I, I imagine that they say to the Taliban, you, you do whatever you want inside the country as long as uh, our economic projects um, will, um, will take place. Uh, and that you ensure safety for um, those projects and that you don't let uh, those Uyghurs um, militants, you know, uh, prosper in Afghanistan. Um, and who wants to invest in Afghanistan right now, except for the Chinese? So it's very important that, um, you know, the, the Taliban have to negotiate with the Chinese in any case, because they are the, uh, the only one who are ready to, to put money on the table for the development of Afghanistan. Um, for their own interests. And um, also about the, the Panchi, um, and then I will uh, uh, leave the floor to, to, the, to the two other speakers. Um, I, I haven't seen anything in the uh, Tajikistani media confirming 
the you know the support. Um, there are rumors. We, we read them online. We read rumors that you know there there are weapons coming um, to Afghanistan from Tajikistan, but there's no official you know declaration or evidence that it's actually supporting um, the Northern Alliance. And I think the Northern Alliance has a lot of support among um, the diaspora, among the Afghans who are outside of Afghanistan. Um, we see a lot of demonstrations. Um, you know, in, in Europe, in the in other countries, um, but what's, it's really unclear what's going on in the Panjshir Valley, um, and uh, information comes, you know, little by little, um, and but but again, what's um, the support from Tajikistan is has not been confirmed, and it's only rumors as far as um, I know, and as far as and that's what we can see uh, in you know the Tajik internet. Thank you, so I'd like, yes. yes, I would like to add uh, uh, um, that um, today a uh, so, uh, fake account on Facebook, uh, Tulu News, fake account, not the original one, um, uh, gave a report saying that the, uh, allegedly some helicopters and military jets uh, were transferred, uh, left from uh, southern Tajikistan to Panjshir Valley. But it was denied by the local authorities and, of course, you know, so officials in uh, Tajikistan as a fake news. So um, these kind of rumors are quite well spread. But so far, as far as we know, Tajikistan has not made any official statement. All we know, Tajikistan is for um, the society in Afghanistan, which protects all stratus of society, including Tajiks. Um, uh, this is the main concern of Tajik uh, authorities. And of course, uh, the uh, militant groups, which are still active in uh, in some parts of Afghanistan, uh, militant groups uh, who are uh, originally from, uh, you know, uh, Tajikistan, uh, who were part of the United Tajik opposition in the 1990s, then they did not uh, want to join the peace process in Tajikistan. They left for Afghanistan and they have been living there. There are mixed families. Uh, some of them grown up, were born in, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan's SWAT area. And uh, uh, although they, their parents from uh, Tajikistan, but uh, they are children of war. So uh, we don't know how strong are they going to be? How uh, how re, uh, how uh, how how they going to uh, impose real threat on Tajikistan? But um, uh, Tajikistan will wait and see, as 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 far as I understand, uh, until the key players in the region, including United States of America, Russia, and China, make final decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's move. We have just a few more minutes on, on two kind of broad comments on the situation. One for uh, uh, Malali. We mentioned in the discussion globally that the majority of people are very tired of war and want peace and maybe peace at any price. And so do you think that on the ground there will be like, except with the few resistance that we see emerging that uh, uh, the majority of Afghans are ready to kind of sacrifice women rights just to get peace with Taliban and ask their, their women to kind of conform to what will be the, the Taliban's decision just to try to kind of be in peace and, and, and continue life as, as more as much as they can. So do you think that this kind of fatigue globally of the society will kind of sacrifice women's right uh, to put it in a in a in a in a sad but but i think realistic way and uh, uh, melanie and uh, uh, sirojidin you mentioned also something really interesting that the question may not be taliban spreading to central asia but taliban ideas spreading to central asia and of course the narrative about corruption Secular regime are corrupt. If it was a religious regime, there won't, there will not be such kind of level of corruption. I would like your perception on how it will be received, and if you think it will kind of suddenly legitimize not specifically Taliban type uh, uh, groups in Central Asia, but any kind of Islamist narrative uh, 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 in the region, especially in Tajikistan, but not only. And I think that was a really important point uh, you made. So Malali, very briefly on the, the, the woman rights future. 
Yeah, I would like to mention that at the current uh, um, uh, situation, if we look at it, uh, the um, economic situation is worsening. Uh, people are not um, attending their jobs anymore. Um, all the um, institutions are closed uh, because the fear is extreme and people are uh, not coming out of their homes. Um, uh, plus, uh, people have been complaining that the prices have gone, uh, like the prices of uh, food and everything else, and including the uh, uh, telephone cards and internet cards, uh, are skyrocketing. So the um, economic situation is going to worsen in the um, next few days. And that would be the concern of the ordinary Afghan, how to feed their children and themselves. Um, uh, and, and they will be busy about that. Actually, the minds are going to be busy about that instead of thinking about the rights and uh, basic human <laughs> uh, needs. Uh, uh, on the, on, uh, also, we need to uh, uh, keep in mind that you know the, the vocal voices that were present in Afghanistan, they are leaving and they are in fear. And there is an extreme brain drain going on right now. People um, uh, who were activists, women who were uh, talking about their rights, and journalists who were uh, free to uh, report on any topic, including the corruption and drugs trade, are leaving the country. So in a kind of a situation when all these people leave, the ordinary Afghans, they will be busy in about surviving. So that's going to um, actually be the, the situation on the ground. Instead of thinking about how to fight this force that has taken over the government, um, they are going to think about um, how to deal with, like uh, how to um, uh, adjust with, with this kind of a new change. Thank you so much, Malali. Sirojidin and Melani. Yes. Uh, yes, um, uh, in 2014, when um, uh, top uh, military commander, Colonel uh, Gulmurad Halimov, uh, who was the commander of special uh, forces of interior minister of Tajikistan, left Tajikistan and ev eventually appeared on um, uh, uh, the, the ISIS TV uh, and became the ISIS uh, 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 minister of war. Everybody was shocked. And the question was, how can uh, military commander colonel become indoctrinated by the ideas of ISIS. Today, we face the same dilemma in Tajikistan as well. In the future, the main concern of the Tajik authorities will be the propaganda war again uh, uh, coming from the other side of the border um, on uh, uh, the ideas of the Ubandi school, you know, Salafi movements, uh, Wahhabi ideas, and it may uh, pose a serious threat to the religious beliefs of uh, people, and it may affect to the uh, uh, to those who who live in, uh, in Tajikistan uh, and are not happy with the current situation in the country. So these uh, young children, young people may also be indoctrinated and joining the, uh, you know, uh, moments uh, which are still active in Afghanistan. Um, this is uh, for the future, of course, but, you know, this might be a real challenge uh, for the Tajik authorities uh, in the future. Yeah, I, I think that, um, like, like we said, rather than being, a, you know, having this geographical lens of, you know, Afghanistan becoming a new haven, like a new uh, territory where those terrorist groups can prosper, um, it, it's uh, we have to to um, we have to see the situation in another way. Um, in other words, uh, it's it's the spread of ideas, like you said, you know. Um, because if, if the Taliban government ends up um, becoming an actual government and ends up being tolerated, not necessarily being recognized by uh, the international community, but being tolerated, uh, then all of those people who are sensitive to um, the ideology of the Taliban and who are not necessarily members of the Taliban, but who are sensitive to their ideology across the world, they're going to think, you know, it's possible to topple a government, and it's possible, it's possible to um, to enforce um, the Islamic law according to them. What's the Islamic law? 
um, in a Muslim country. So uh, they're, they're probably gonna, you know, act on that, on the fact that the Taliban are becoming a model for them. And um, it's 2021, you know, 20 years have passed. So um, radicalization has hit more and more people than uh, when the Taliban were um, uh, in control of Afghanistan uh, at the end of the, um, the 90s. So we have more people who are sensitive to their um, ideology. Um, and also in 2021, a lot of, is going on through the internet and through social media. So there, there's, there's a lot that's gonna be you know, circulating um, and, and we have to, to, to take a, a, a close look at that and not necessarily at the fact that those people are going to go to Afghanistan to, um, to get trained like we've seen in the past um, before, 20, before 2001, um, but those people are probably gonna stay where they are wherever in the world, and they're probably going to, you know, act on what they see on social media and on the news um, regarding Afghanistan. Thank you so much. And with that, it's already time for us to conclude. Our hours is already uh, uh, over. I wanted to thank you, our three uh, speakers, Malali Bashir, senior editor with uh, Radio Azadi, Sirojin Talibov from the uh, RFE RL Afghan uh, uh, sorry, Tajik service, and Melanie Sadozai uh, uh, finishing her PhD in France and uh, uh, associate to GW Central Asia program. Once again, we want to thank you for your um, uh, sharing your insight almost live where things are unfolding on the ground. It's a kind of half di academic discussion, half reporting, because that's how the situation is now, and we will continue to have event uh, uh, on the, the discussing what is happening in Afghanistan thanking also all our uh, participants today for being here and wishing everybody to, to stay safe. And please, if you can press your academic or whatever institution you belong to, to act as soon as possible to help Afghans who can to live because it's really a question of days now left uh, to help. Thank you very much, all of you, and hope to see you very soon for another event. Thank you.